Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I welcome those who are joining us uh, at home, on television, the internet, wherever you may be, and of course, those of you who are here in person in our sanctuary. So as we worship today, we're going to continue our exploration of some of the foundational teachings of the Christian faith. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about the Christian life and our call to live a life of good works. Will you join me in prayer? O oh God, you have shown us the way of servanthood and of loving service. You have given us so much so that we can be a blessing to others. Lord, we ask that you would help us to choose your path so that we may be light in the world. In this time of worship, we do ask that you would pour your Spirit out upon us, and we pray these things in the name of the one who came to serve, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Galatians. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at par harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all and especially for those of the family of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are continuing a uh, conversation and exploration of some of the foundational teachings of the Christian faith. Um, and if you uh, have missed some of the sermons in this series or uh, have, haven't seen any of them, I would uh, remind you that you can always go to the church's website and you can find them there. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about the Christian life. And of course, uh, as part of this exploration, we're looking at what the scriptures have to say about some of these various topics, but I'm also using as a framework uh, these articles of religion of the United Methodist Church, and this is a, a packet that we've made available over the last several weeks. I think there's some in the pews still. I see one poking out right there. I have so seen some of you very dutifully with your name on the front of these, and I noticed you've been taking notes in them, and I've imagined you at home sleeping with them and really, really diving into this. Uh, uh, for those of you at home, there is a QR code available. You can go to an electronic version of this. It's always available on our website. Uh, but again, in the Christian life, I'm going to talk, I'm going to try to cover articles 10, 11, 12, 23, 24, 25, and 27 today. Whose idea was this anyway? Okay. So one of the things that has always puzzled me uh, about sort of the Christian faith is this. If salvation is a gift of God's grace, freely given, which we believe, right? Everybody with me? Salvation is a gift of God's grace, freely given, right? I want to make sure you got that. Then why does it seem like there are so many to-dos in the Christian life? If salvation is a gift, which I really do believe it is, then why do I have to come to worship? Why do I have to read my Bible? Why do I have to pray? And in particular, I want to talk today about why are we called to do good works? If this is a free gift, why do I have to do all this stuff? And uh, Article 10 of the Articles of Religion really kind of, I think, help us to begin to understand why this is. And I'm actually going to read the, the full article to you. I'm not going to do that with all of them. Uh, but this is the one, one of the ones I really want to zero in on. So Article 10 says this. Although good works, which are the fruits of faith and follow after justification, cannot put away our sins and endure the severity of God's judgment, yet are they pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ and spring out of a true and lively faith, insomuch that by them a lively faith may be as evidently known as a tree is discerned by its fruit. 
okay? So there's really two things that uh, Wesley is telling us here. One is, is that good works cannot put away our sins. So he's confirming for us that our salvation and our place with God does not come from good works. That's here in, in this article. And yet, he says, good works are pleasing and acceptable to God, and this is the key, spring out of a true and lively faith. So they don't save us, but they spring out of a, 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 true, a true faith. So how are we to understand this? Probably one of the best explanations I ever heard that kind of helped me get my head and heart around this goes something like this. Christianity is, an, is not an if-then religion. It is a because God religion, okay? Not if-then, but what? Because God. So this is not Christianity. If you forgive others, then God will forgive you. Or if you pray, then God will give you peace. Or if you love and serve others, then God will love you and take care of you. That is not Christianity. Uh, and I think sometimes people get that idea about it, right? Instead, Christianity is this. Because God forgives me, I forgive others. Because God is peace itself, I spend time drawing near in prayer to the one who is peace. Because God loves me and has blessed me in so many ways, I do what? I love and serve others. But do you see where the starting place is? The starting place is not sort of my efforts. Uh, the starting place is who God is and what God has already done. Not if then, but what? Because God. Um, Richard Rohr, I think, uh, kind of helps me also to get my head around this with this type of language. He says, unless we're careful, we will make Jesus' descending religion into a new form of climbing religion. I'm going to say that again. If, unless we're careful, we will make Jesus' descending religion into a new form of climbing religion religion. And what he means by that is the descending religion starts with God, God coming to us, God acting in human history, God saving us, God acting in our lives. Uh, our starting place is because God loved us, right? As opposed to us trying to do what? Climb up and work our way to God. And that, that's the difference. And as we uh, move into a little more conversation about good works, I want to make sure that we understand that, right? that good works and these actions and these things that we do as Christians are the result of life with God. They are fruit of life with God. They are not the cause of a life with God. Are we clear on that? Okay. Now, with that said, there is, however, no doubt that Christians are called to do good works in this world. Uh, so the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 7 uh, that there are really two ways of living in the world. One he calls sowing to the flesh. The other he calls sowing to the Spirit. Uh, so one thing we need to be clear about when Paul uses this language about the flesh is we shouldn't misunderstand him to be saying that there is something wrong with having a body or that there's something wrong with the fact that yesterday I craved a chocolate bar or there's something wrong with the fact that sometimes I get tired and I need a nap or there's, something, there's nothing wrong with me loving it when my son comes up and hugging me and I feel the warmth of his body against me and I love... Uh, there's, there's, not, like, there's nothing wrong with that part of the flesh, right? Those are all beautiful God-given things about being alive and being human. When Paul talks about the flesh, what he's talking about is sort of that fallen side of humanity, uh, the, the, the too worldly, too earthly, too given to the things of this life, okay? Uh, and basically what he's saying is, again, there's two ways that we can be in the world. We can sort of pursue a, a sort of selfish agenda where it's all about me and it's all about my wants and it's all about my desires and that that is a spiral that leads to nothing good. Or we can sow to the Spirit. We can live life God's way and we can live lives of, of love and peace and reconciliation and kindness and goodness and that that is a way of life that leads to abundance and leads to greater life, right? This is the, this is the idea that he's setting up for us. Uh, one is a life living out of the broken and false self the other is leaning into a new and restored self that's being made new by Christ, right? 
But again, we are called to good works, Paul tells us, and we should never tire of doing good in the world. And this is something that we see lived out very purposefully and powerfully from our Methodist ancestors. So early Methodists, in addition to proclaiming the gospel in the world, also strove to do good. Uh, They began the first free clinic and dispensary in London. They provided housing for the poor. They began a school to teach disadvantaged children. They started a lending fund from which they were able to rescue people from debtor's prison. Uh, They were constantly seeking ways that they could do good, to choose sowing in the spirit in the world. Uh, It's also important for us to know that Wesley's good works didn't just include doing works of charity. He also weighed in and used his power and his influence uh, about important social matters. Uh, So one thing that's important and that we need to celebrate as Methodists is that John Wesley opposed slavery fiercely. Uh, He called it the execrable sum of all villainy. Isn't that a great line? execrable sum of all villainy. Uh, And he would write to members of parliament to encourage them in their fight against the institution of slavery. And one of the letters he wrote was to William Wilberforce, who's probably one of the most famous abolitionists. But this is what he wrote to Wilberforce. He said, oh, be not weary of doing good. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery the vilest that ever saw the sun shall vanish away before it. Uh, So to help the Methodist people to find shape to this doing good in the world, uh, Wesley devised uh, what are known as the general rules of the Methodist church. Are you all familiar with these general rules? They're They're really pretty simple. There's three of them. The first one is this, do no harm. And, uh, and I find that these, these, these rules are a great framework just for thinking, how do I approach life? How do I approach every day? But first one is do no harm. Pretty good rule, right? Uh, the second one is this, do good. Uh, Methodists were called to do good of every possible sort. We were sort of uh, the kind of people who are supposed to go out in the world and go, where can I sow seeds of goodness? And where can I sow seeds of love? And how can I help? And that's the way our minds are supposed to be all the time. And the third rule was this, tending upon the ordinances of God. Now, what does that mean? So there was a Methodist bishop named Reuben Job who wrote a book called Three Simple Rules, and it talks about the general rules of the Methodist church. Uh, And he says the first rule is do good. The second rule, I'm sorry, do no harm. The second rule is do good. And the third one, he says this way, stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. And in Wesley's language, tending to the ordinances of God is participating in things that cultivate our relationship with God. So it's things like worship, and it's things like prayer. It's things like reading the Scripture. So those are the ordinances of God. But Reuben Job says, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. And by the way, it's a great book if anyone, everyone is interested. Uh, I also think it's important to note that for us as Christians, doing good is not just a sometime thing. It's not something we do once a week like taking out the trash. Doing good for us as Christians is a way of life. Uh, The general rules that Wesley gave us were intended to guide every aspect of our lives. So students, when you go to school, ask yourselves the question, uh, how can I do no harm? How can I do good? How can I stay in love with God? When you go to work, when you're in your household, when you're, uh, when you're tending, doing the leisure things that you do, when you're traveling. Again, you, those three rules are a framework for every aspect of our life. Uh, so although John Wesley did not say this, and I have to go on the record and say this is not a John Wesley saying, uh, this famous Methodist aphorism, I think, describes the way that we are to live in the world. Some of you will know this one. Do all the good that you can, by all the means that you can, in all of the ways that you can, in all of the places that you can, in all of the times that you can, to all of the people that you can, as long as ever you can. But again, we need to remember, why are we doing these things? Not if then, but what? Because God. 
So let me pause here to ask you this. How are you doing in doing good? What specific good works are you engaged in? Can you, can you think of some things? This is, this is sort of part of what I do with my life. Would you describe your life more as sowing to the flesh or, flowing, or sowing to the Spirit? Are good works something you do every once in a while, or do you understand them to be just a part of who you are? It's part of your identity. And again, not as a way of leveraging God to love you. God already loves you. But in response to God's love, which is, in Wesley's language, already shed abroad in our hearts, right? Um, So if you're looking for a few good things to be able to do, you can buy a mission lunch today and support the work of the One Stop. You can buy salsa. You can volunteer to help some kids at the Carver Library. There's also an entire list of things on the back of the bulletin. This is just for people who, you know, if you're looking for something, right? You uh, You can become a congregational care lay minister. You can become a part of our cancer support ministry. There's a mission trip coming up to Costa Rica where we start. I mean, no shortage of things to do if you're looking for good to do. Uh, So a few more things about the many, many other articles that I said I was going to talk about today. And then I want to end by really focusing on Article 12, which gives us a hopeful and helpful word about forgiveness, which, if you're going to try to live in the world in such a way that you do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God, you're going to need. So some of these other articles. So Article 11 is kind of a fascinating one, uh, and it talks about works of supererogation. And uh, this is kind of an important idea. So works of supererogation. Supererogation literally means paying more than is due. And what this article is written for is it's in response to what the reformers saw as abuses in the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And I do want to say, if you're reading through the articles and you pick up maybe a little bit of like an an anti-Roman Catholic kind of push a little bit, that's real. It's in there. But you have to realize where we are in history. We're right after the Protestant Reformation. There have literally been wars fought between Protestants and Roman Catholics. So there's a little bit of an anti-Catholic push in here. Um, I would say to you, uh, you know, Wesley was a man of his time as far as some of that's concerned. But works of supererogation. The Roman Catholic Church did a couple of things in those days that the Protestant reformers kind of pushed back against. One was uh, doing, doing something called selling indulgences. And so if, you, if there were a, a certain sin that you wanted to be forgiven for, and especially if you were a wealthy sinner, uh, the church would say, oh, yeah, we can forgive you. Forget this is how much it costs. And they literally put like a price tag on it. And again, uh, that would be paying more than is due, right? Because for the Protestant reformers, it was Christ's once and for all sacrifice that paid the price for everything. There's nothing more to be paid. Uh, So those were some of the things that the Catholic Church was doing at the time that the reformers are kind of pushing back against a little bit. Um, Articles 23, 24, 25, and then this very last one, which really doesn't have a number, but it's called on the duty of Christians to the civil authority have to do with being good citizens. It's really all it's about. And all I'm going to say about that is this. Uh, So John Wesley was opposed to the American Revolution. Uh, You've got to think about the times that these, these things were being written. It was late 1700, so the American Revolution is going on, and Wesley was loyal to the king. And the reason he was loyal to the king was not just out of some blind loyalty, but he believed that God had put in place government and authorities for the good of people. And that when we were governed well and when things were orderly, that we would have liberty and we would have peace and we would be able to practice our faith and enjoy the things that God has given us. So people rising up against the God-given authority in Wesley's idea in his mind was, you know, going against God in some ways. However, Once the American Revolution was settled, he did acknowledge uh, the lawful constitutional government of the United States as a new governmental authority. But this whole democracy thing was a new new idea, right? Uh, So in the articles that were written in 1784, uh, one of them says uh, that we should obey the rulers of the United States. They are the rightful government. So again, I see this, and one of the reasons I included this in this section about uh, Christian life is that part of our duty 
is to be good citizens and to, and to obey the lawful authorities, right? That in Wesley's mind, that brings liberty and that brings peace and that allows us to uh, enjoy the good things of God. So that's, that's what those articles have to do with. So the last article that I want to touch on, and I really want to dive in a little deeper here, is Article 12, which talks about forgiveness. In particular, it talks about forgiveness after justification. So after we've come to Christ, after we have begun to live the Christian life, uh, that we, there will be times where we need to be forgiven. So we believe that human beings were created in the image of God, right? Uh, we were created to do no harm. We were created to do good, and we were created to live in love with God. We believe that as as Christians that through Christ we have been restored to that original state uh, and that we are supposed to be living in the world as good and ethical beings, right? Uh, but, and here's the but, there will be times where we mess up. There will be. There are going to be times where we do harm. There are going to be times where we do not do good. And there are going to be times where we don't tend very well to our relationship with God. Can I get an amen? So, what are we to do in those times? What are we to do? Do we, just, do we just hang it up? And by the way, there were some people in Wesley's day who said, if you fall into sin after you come to Christ and after justification, there is no hope for you. Wesley didn't believe that. So this is what Article 12 says. Not every sin willingly committed after justification is a sin against the Holy Spirit and unpardonable. Wherefore, the grant of repentance is not to be denied to such as fall into sin after justification. After we have received the Holy Ghost, we may depart from grace given and fall into sin. And by the grace of God, this is the key part here, we may rise again and amend our lives. So again, we will mess this up. What should we do, right? The good news is this. By the grace of God, we can rise again and amend our lives. We can begin again. We can. Uh, and this is why the idea of forgiveness is so vital and so essential in the Christian life. Forgiveness is that thing that allows us to say, ah, oh, boy, I got that wrong. And it allows us to move forward and to, again, in, in Wesley's language, amend our lives and begin to choose sowing in the Spirit once again. I saw a great quote from Henry Nouwen this week about forgiveness. He said this, Forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. Think about that. Forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly, who mess it up. And the hard truth is that all people love poorly. We need to forgive and to be forgiven every day, every hour increasingly. That is the great work of love among the fellowship of the weak that is the human family. So listen to me. I want to be clear about this. You are called to do good works in the world. Do you understand that? Do no harm, do good, Stay in love with God. Not to climb your way to God. Not if then, but why? Because God. Because God. But hear this also. There are going to be times where you get it wrong. Don't give up. Get up and return to Christ again and again and again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.